Welcome to Advanced Traverse Engineering. The midterm is due. It's a take home, open book, open notes exam. No collaboration, however. It's intended to test your understanding of the concepts. 17 questions, best 10 are counted. All right, let's talk about loops and strings. So up at the top, you see some highly pronounceable mnemonics. The count register RCX is special, and it even has its own conditional branch instructions to test whether the register content is zero. Given that you know this now, if you look back at those commands, maybe they don't look so foreign. Jump if RCX zero. Jump if ECX zero jump if CX zero. There you go. Now these instructions do not test the zero flag. Instead, they straight up test the contents of the register. So again, RCX treated differently from other registers. Searching through all of the executables in user bin, I found this used in BusyBox, in Blender, in Pandoc, Rclone, and nothing else. Now, this probably means the compilers in general don't use it, or they don't necessarily generate it. But, you know, I didn't use a pristine Ubuntu installation, and I just searched for CXZ, so who knows if I would necessarily have found it. When it's used in BusyBox, it appears to be signaling whether to take a branch in the subroutine. Uh, that is... It's an argument that specifies whether to take one of two options. Remember loop? So the loop label instruction is almost equivalent to deck RCX jump not zero to label. What is the difference? Well, the difference is that the latter instruction sets flags, right? Deck RCX sets flags but the loop instruction does not. It still compares RCX to zero, but it doesn't set any flags. Now, look over at the code that's over on the right, use your assembly reading skills, and tell me what is the exit value of this program, right? The final value in this case, that will be an EDI when system exit is called. So go ahead and pause here, Take some time to look at it, see what you think the exit value is going to be, and then we'll continue, right? So I'm going to load RCX with this. I'm going to run the loop. Uh, RSI is going to get that. RBX is going to get that. REX is going to get 60 for exit. I'm going to do a syscall and halt. Okay. Flags are actually set right here with the compare RCX and 76. Okay, what is RCX? It's this. So that comparison is not going to be successful. All right, the zero flag is going to be clear because 76 and FFFF are not the same. So the zero flag is clear. The move does not modify flags. This move does not modify flags. The loop does not modify flags. Moving zero into RSI does not modify the flags. So when I get here to the conditional move, I'm going to look at ZF, but ZF was only set right here. So it's clear. So this move does not happen. Nothing is from RBX is copied into RDI, which means the contents of RDI, whatever we set it to last, well, right up here, we set it to 100. That means that down here, when we get to the actual syscall, RDI is still going to be 100. That's significant. But this shows you a little bit about how you can take some code and you can appeal to the intuition of the person reading it. In this case, it's, it should be clear. It should be obvious that this sets zero or this sets zero. And so this is always going to happen. But in fact, it is guaranteed to be clear and to not happen. 
So there are some other variants of the loop instruction that we can talk about. Loop E and loop any. And they have synonyms. Loop E is a synonym for loop Z. Loop any is a synonym for loop NZ. And that's pretty much normal, right? Uh, branch if not equal and branch if not zero, again, those are the same. Two variants for mnemonics. These all terminate when RCX reaches zero. That's the same behavior as loop. So if I'm using loop E in place of loop, I'm still going to count RCX down to zero. But they can also terminate early. And they terminate early by testing the zero flag. So for example, with the loop Z, if RCX is one, I decrement it. Now it's zero. I check it for zero. It matches. I terminate. Or... I decrement RCX and I check the zero flag, the zero flag is set, then I terminate. Okay, make sense? So there's two different conditions under which uh, the loop will terminate. So let's take a look at the code at right. I put 10 in RCX, I compare RCX to seven, and I do a loop NE, loop not equal, back to top. So if this were just straight loop, this would count down 10 times. Because it's not, it's going to be 10 compared to 7. Does not match. It's not, RCX is not 0, and the 0 flag is not set, so I go around. Now RCX is 9. Doesn't match. I go around. 8. And if I come around at 7, 7 matches. The 0 flag is set. And this loop not equal fails because now I am equal. And so I fall through before counting RCX all the way down to 10. All right, makes sense. What will RCX be here? It will be six, right? It was seven here when the zero flag got set. Then I hit the loop instruction. The loop instruction always decrements RCX. So the seven becomes a six. And that's what we have here. Six gets put into RDI, and the return value of this whole thing is going to be six. Here's another example. I start out with RCX 10. I compare it to negative seven. It's never going to match. So in this case, the loop's going to count all the way down to zero and terminate. Now... We're going to decrement RCX when it's 1. It's going to be 0. We'll compare it to 0 and we'll stop, which means at the end of this, RCX will be 0. 0 will be put into RDI and we'll terminate. The return value will be 0. Hope this makes sense to you. How common are these? Well, not very, uh, but they are around. So loop E, loop uh, while equal, it shows up 21 times in pseudo, pseudo replay, blender, and transmission. Loop Z never shows up because it's the synonym for loop E, and so the disassembler probably prefers loop E over loop Z. Loop E and E shows up once in Pandoc, and other any other loop CC shows up about 109 times, and that could be just loop or any member of the loop family. Now, in addition, these processors have string-oriented instructions. We've mentioned before, RSI is the source register, RDI is the destination register, there is a direction flag, and I've mentioned before that there are string operations. These are the string-oriented operations. And there are five basic operations. Move, which copies information from one location to another. And it can copy it byte by byte, word by word, double word by double word, or quad word by quad word from the source to the destination. And it increments or decrements, depending on the direction flag, both RSI and RDI by the correct stride. How many things does it copy? It copies the number based on what's in RCX. Compare string. Here we compare 
by word, double word, or quad word from the source to the destination, incrementing RSI and RDI each time. Scatter string. Uh, this one's a little different. So the two above use both the source and destination registers. Scan string compares a byte, word, double word, or quad word from RDI to AL, AX, EAX, or RAX. In other words, we take the uh, destination and we check it against, if it's, a, if it's a byte, we check it against AL, if it's a word, AX, a double word, EAX, and a quad word, RAX. How do we know which one? There is a suffix at each of these, right? So SCA for SCA, S for string, and then B for byte, word, double word, or quad word. And we commit a decrement RDI each time. Load from string. So another one that's a little bit unusual. Here we move a byte, word, double word, or quad word, right, from the string pointed to by RSI into AL, AX, EX, or RAX based on the size of data we want and increment or decrement RSI. Store to string does the opposite. It moves the byte word, double word, or quad word from AL, AX, EX, or RAX to RDI increments or decrements RDI. And again, the number of times these things happen is controlled by RCX. So I can move a string, compare a string, load from string or store to string, and then scan a string where I'm scanning across the string looking for some specific entry. This table talks about string operations. It turns out that the input and output operations are highly parallel. So at the bottom you see NSB, NSW, etc., out SB, out SW, etc. Okay, these input uh, from an input port and output to an output port uh, using the processor's AI subsystem. The direction flag controls the direction of the string instructions. Normally, you probably don't care what's in this. But if the two regions can overlap, then you might. Okay, you might. So suppose I have a source and a destination where the two blocks overlap. All right. And think again, think now about the copy. If I let's say that the source is earlier in memory than the destination, but they overlap. So as I copy from the source to the destination, just moving the same, just moving forward, I will overwrite the latter part of the source where they overlap. And that's bad because I'm erasing information before I copy it. But if I reverse this and I work backwards from the end of the data, then I won't do that. So setting up the direction flag can, can help you do this when regions overlap. They don't overlap, probably doesn't matter. The basic idea, if the direction uh, flag is clear, then you'll increment each time. If it's set, you'll decrement each time. How do you set the direction flag? You use set direction flag STD. To clear it, you use CLD. Okay. The flag is commonly clear, so you're incrementing. But if you want to use this, it's probably a good idea to set or clear the flag appropriately before you use it. Suppose you don't know that it's set to decrement and you set things up. Now you're going to be in trouble because you're starting at the beginning of your data, but now you're working backwards, so you're immediately walking back into some other data and screwing that up. So checking the flag is a good idea. How common is this? It's actually pretty common. Uh, move SX shows up a lot, as does compare, scan, uh, etc. These show up quite a bit because these are very convenient instructions. They deal with you know, chunks of contiguous data. There are also the repeat uh, modifiers. These are not themselves instructions, but they can be used in combination with one of the string instructions to cause it to repeat. 
How often do they repeat? That's controlled by, uh, by the RCX registry. So I mentioned before, you can use RCX to control how often that happens. This is the mechanism for doing that. Move SB by itself will just do one thing and update the registers. It'll increment uh, RSI and RDI. If you want to do multiple times, you need to put rep in front of it. And that will repeat the move SB until RCX reaches zero. Same way as loop would do it. Along those lines, remember loop E, loop NE, loop Z, loop NZ. Same thing here, but with the repeat instructions. Okay, And again, these are prefixes, not instructions themselves. So over on the right, you can see I want to copy a string. I want to copy from stir to pad, and I want to copy this many bytes. So I put the number of bytes in RCX. I put the source and the destination, the appropriate registers, has to be these registers. I can't use any others. I have to use RSI, RDI, and RCX. Then doing the actual copy is easy. I just say rep move SB. Ideally, I would have already cleared the direction flag, but since I'm starting here, I'm going to assume the direction flag is clear. There you go. Find the first exclamation mark and replace it with a period. This is a good use of this sort of stuff. So I take pad, which is where my copy is. I load it into RDI. I load the byte I'm looking for into AL. I load the length of the string into RCX and I repeat while not equal SCASB. So now what's happening here? SCASB is scanning byte by byte across the string. The B is for byte, scanning byte by byte across the string. If it finds a match for this, the zero flag is going to be set because of that match. And so the repeat while not equal will then fail and it'll drop out. Now, I will be off because just like when, just like the fact that loop always decrements RCX, the scan always increments or decrements, depending on the direction flag, RDI. So in this case, I'm moving forward. The correct location where the exclamation mark is, is actually at RDI minus one. And I put a period there. All right. Hope that makes some sense to you. Uh, try out that code and have some fun. Notice that this instruction runs however long it needs, as does this one. There's no direct branching in the code. It's just an instruction that does a lot of work. And that's great because it eliminates branching. So... Now I have slides that go through these two examples which I just went through. That's fine. The only way to learn assembly is to spend time reading and figuring it out. And then spend time writing assembly language to understand it better. You need to do both really to get good with assembly. Let's talk about control flow in assembly programs. And in particular, let's talk about anti-disassembly. So, remember, the actual state of the machine is the ground truth. And everything else might be a lie or misleading. Object code is treated as if the control flow is static and explicit, but that's not necessarily true. The control flow can be modified, potentially at runtime, and you can do that in a number of ways. Now, almost all disassemblers assume an address will be used only once in a listing, right? It will not show up somewhere else. That's not true. And it isn't even true that an address is only part of one instruction. And a single address in a program might all might be part of multiple instructions. How could such a thing happen? Well, we're going to talk about that right now. So here is what I'm going to call linear disassembly. Most assemblers assume that the linear sequence of bytes includes, encodes a linear sequence of, of instructions. But that's really just an assumption. So over on the right, we have EBFF, that's jump minus one. 
followed by 31 CE, that exclusive ores to registers together. Is that what that really does? What's that jump minus one doing? Well, let's take a closer look at that. So we're executing the jump minus one instruction. What does that do? Well, we start out, RIP is pointing at the first byte of the next linear instruction. That's how RIP works. What does jump minus one do? Well, it does just what it says. It decrements RIP by one. So now RIP is pointing at that FF and we have to reinterpret that as an instruction and that turns out to be push instruction, a push instruction with RCX followed by a return and so they won't return. So, so there you go. So the original instruction looked like we're going to do two instructions in a row and perhaps keep going, but that's not what happens at all. What happens is we push uh, the value pointed to by RCX and then we immediately return and we're done and whatever else was after that doesn't happen. So that's a little bit, that's a little bit obscure, but it's simple. Let's look at a more complex example. So here we have a linear sequence of instructions, a move, an exclusive or, jump zero minus six, and a call. So let's see how that all works out. So we do the move, we exclusive or EAX with itself, which does set the zero flag, which means this jump zero minus six is going to happen. So we execute that while that's executing RIP is here. And so we're going to subtract six, one, two, three, four, five, six, taking us back to that EB. EB zero five is actually jump five. Where is RIP pointing when that executes? Well, it's pointing right here. So we count forward five, one, two, three, four, five, five from bypassing the call instruction and getting to whatever the real code is, which was hidden by the original disassembly. And now the real code can execute. Notice some of these bytes were part of two instructions, right? This EB and 05, they were part of this jump five instruction, also part of this move AX instruction. Both of those execute. So these bytes execute are executed by the system two different times as parts of two different instructions. Okay, same thing over here for, for these guys. The real code happens here. So again, what looks like the target of a call turns out to actually be some other code doing who knows what. This is what the control flow looks like. A little bit weird, but it does mess up a linear type disassembly. It's pretty easy to code this. You may, may think I would have a hard time creating this. Turns out it's not that hard. So for example, we want this move uh, AX, we want this XOR, and they want to do a jump zero minus six. What's going on with this minus four? Well, again, the assembler versus the processor, a little different here, okay? The JZ minus six assumes that we're pointing here. And we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. But when we're actually doing assembly, we're actually pointing at the current guy. So it's one, two, three, four to get to the correct position. There we go. Now we need to waste some space. And so we put a data byte in here. The E8 is how you start a call. So we just throw that in. And then our hidden code begins here. And the further explanation of why minus four and not minus six. The dollar sign, remember, uh, is the pseudo label for the address of the current instruction. The data byte is there to encode the call instruction. All right, so here's the object dump. 
of that code. And you'll notice we do a move XOR JE2. That would be somewhere up in the middle of this. Call 16CC, add some stuff to assist call and halt. This looks reasonable. It looks like a basic block. But in reality, it's not quite what it's doing. So object has gotten it wrong. Now, this kind of code isn't necessarily going to fool a lot of tools, but it will fool a surprising number. Let's talk about another technique, push return. So a push return uh, is a little different technique. It's a, another common idiom in addition to push return is push push return, um, etc. So over here on the right hand side, we start, we load uh, REX with the address of there, which is down here. We increment RAX, so now we're pointing past this data byte. We push RAX onto the stack. We zero out EX just for fun, and we return. Where does this return go? Well, it returns back to the caller of start, right? No. This return goes here. How? Well, we loaded REX with the pointer to there. We incremented it, so now we're pointing it at the beginning of this move, and we pushed it onto the stack. The thing on the top of the stack is the address of this move, and that's what's on top of the stack when we return, and there we go. Now, return takes us here and we do this code. Push push return can be done as well. Push one address, push another address. This return will go to B and then within B we might do another return to go to A. Okay? Equivalent to call B and then jump A. Hope that makes sense. Push jump is another I push an address, I jump somewhere, and when that returns, I go to the address that I pushed. What does Ghidra make of all this? Well, even Ghidra needs some help with this, and this is true at the time of writing. It cannot decompile this code. It does correctly compute the value pushed on the stack this time, but we can make that, comp that computation as complex as we wish and we can beat it. And you can see it's it's terribly confused about it. Most, and maybe all, security depends on somebody somewhere playing by the rules. Some of those rules are explicit. Some of those rules are not explicit. They may be tacit rules. Rules that, you know, aren't written down. They're just conventions. Sometimes you don't actually have to follow the rules. You can just pretend to, right? Some rules can be broken. There's no enforcement. The stack, in particular, is just unprotected memory. You can write to it or read from it however you want to. You can modify the stack pointer however you want, so long as you don't trigger the operating system's heap guards or override a stack canary. We may talk about stack canaries later in the class. The instruction pointer is just another register, and you can modify it in a bunch of ways. So there's lots of stuff you can do uh, to make things very, very difficult for analysis programs to deal with it. At the end of the day, what's really going on in the machine is the true machine state. Your attempt to disassemble it is just your best effort to understand it. All right, control flow. Here is a piece of Linux source code taken from uh, the latest Linux source. And you can see what's going on here. We do some stuff. We check to see if something is true. If it is, we go to fail. We check this. If it's true, go to fail. Check this. If it's true, go to fail. And they return S. There's a bunch of go-tos. You were probably told not to use go-tos. Go-tos are all over the Linux kernel 
and they're all over most embedded software. Okay, it turns out to be a good way to do certain things, potentially if you're careful. The idea behind it uh, is to, when you so look at this code right here, we've got some pretty deeply nested code. We could make it, we could get rid of this go to, but we'd have to make it more deeply nested for that to be the case. It's easy to just say, hey, if we fail to grab super, go to retry. We spin up here and we repeat. Same thing down here. Just go up to retry. So it's an implicit loop and it's done in a way that, you know, it buries the lead down here in it, but it simplifies the code. And you'll see that a lot. One of the main reasons is to avoid what's known as arrow code. So over here, we see some go-tos. We try to do some stuff. If it fails, we then unwind it. So we try to do A. If we get an error, then we out A, return it. We do B. If we get an error, we do out B, which undoes B, then undoes A and return. If we get an error after C, we undo all three of them and return. We can make that into if then else is like this, and we have this arrow shape, this triangle shape, chuck of, of nesting. And generally, people like to avoid deep nesting. And GoTo will let us do that. All right. A flow graph is a graph whose vertices are program nodes. They could be single operations, they could be subprograms, they could be basic blocks. But it's a chunk that executes together basically atomically. The connections then are flow among them. So let's talk about two different kinds of nodes. A function node performs some operation. In this case, we've labeled it with the function F. And then control flows to the next operation. A predicate node is a little different. It computes some predicate, preferably without a side effect, and if true, we flow to one location. If false, we flow to a different location. So an example of a function node is adding two registers. An example of a predicate node is a conditional branch. All right. We can classify most assembly operations as functions or predicates, and there are some you can't. So, repni move sb, even though it's got this implicit loop, we can treat it as a function node. This is a predicate node, right? Jump if ecx0 to dot bound 1, and a combination loop any to dot top. This is, you know, this is, is a function node in that it modifies rcx. It's also a predicate node in that it checks certain conditions before going on. A proper program is a program that has a single entry point. That is, control flow enters it at the same place every time. It has a single exit point, and that is, control flows out of the program to a single destination. That doesn't mean there's just one exit from the program. That means that all exits from the program go to the same destination. All right? If you've got a program that has a bunch of different return statements in it, that's fine. That's okay. Those are all going back to the caller. But if you have a program where there are some returns, but then there's some other ways to flow out to different locations, that's not a proper program anymore. For every node in the program, there's a path from entry to exit that contains that node. What does that mean? That means there's no unreachable or trap code. And a proper program represents a single function. And you can often decompose a proper program into proper subprograms. Over on the right, this guy right here is a proper program. Control always enters here at the top. There's no returns or anything, so control always exits here at the bottom and, re and returns to the caller. It's got a little if-then statement in here. 
And here's what the control flow graph looks like. Again, I'm using squares for functions, diamonds for predicates, and this little collector node here just to pull the arrows together. Is there a subprogram that's also a proper program? Yeah, there is. If I cut this arrow right here and I cut the one over here, I have a single entry, single exit, path through the whole thing, subprogram that, that drops the first and the last nodes. All right. Programs can be composed by replacing a function node in one program with a proper program. So this gives us a way to compose programs or to decompose programs. Now, this works. This will always work because function nodes have a single entry and single exit, just like a proper program, so I can wire them in pretty easily. If the original program was a proper program, the new program, where I've done the substitution, will also be a proper subprogram or proper program. In addition, there are primes. A prime program contains no proper subprograms other than single nodes. So let's look at the first one up here. This is a prime program. It contains no proper subprogram of more than of uh Here's a proper subprogram that has more than one node, right? The only proper subprograms would be F by itself or G by itself. That's just one node, so it doesn't count. The one below it, same thing is true. I have to cut a single in arrow and a single out arrow. Only place I can do that is around F, around G, and those are single nodes. Down below it, same rule. So sequence, if then else, and while do all program primes. The last one is not a program prime. This is not a prime. Why is that? Because I can grab G and F together here in the middle. That is a proper subprogram of more than one node, of two nodes in this case. So that's not a prime. So we have a composition rule. Programs are composed of other programs. There are program primes. So Putting all that together, we wind up with a key idea, which is we can compose programs from primes or uniquely decompose a program into a product of primes, a little prime programs. And that's kind of a neat little idea. The resulting program built out of primes is called a composite program. There are lots of common primes. If they else while do, do until do while do, case, a bunch of them. And in fact, you can demonstrate that there are infinitely many prime programs, just like there are infinitely many prime integers. Over here, we see how to do that. This is a little proof by construction. I can repeat this piece as many times as I want, and because of the structure of it, it's still a prime. Unbounded number of uh, primes. Can any program with go to be transformed into a program without go to? That's an interesting question. And we can think of that as can a program with a set of structures be transformed into a program with just a few fixed structures? If I can find a set of structures that doesn't include go to, that constitute a basis set from which I can build any program, that's pretty neat. Uh, and we see that kind of thing in other fields, okay? In number three, we have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, where I can build any number out of primes. This would be the equivalent, but for programs. So a basic idea is a structured program. This is a program composed using a fixed finite basis set of program primes. So I don't let you use them all. I've identified a finite set and you can use those. That's the important place where we're different from integers. I have to have all the primes to build all the integers. This says that perhaps I can get away with a finite set of primes 
to build all the structured programs. In this way, it's more similar to logic. I have a functionally complete set, right? If I have and, or, and not, I can build any Boolean operator. If I have NAND alone, I can build any Boolean operator just by combining it in clever ways. Same thing here. I can't do that with integers. I can't make a 7 from other primes that aren't 7, right? 7 is, is prime. But here I can build in, here the, the assertion is I can build any program with a finite set of, of primes. And it turns out the usual basis set is while do, if, then, else, and sequence. And the question is, is that sufficient? And here's where we get an interesting little wrinkle. Can any program be converted to a structured program? And the answer is no. Only proper programs can be converted to structured programs. Okay? If we start with a prime, and we compose primes, we're starting with a proper program, and we're composing them, and every composition yields a proper program. So I can't build an improper program out of primes. Can't do it. So if I'm trying to match an improper program, I can't do it. But improper programs are weird. They are weird. You don't want those. That takes us to the structure theorem. Every proper program is execution equivalent to a structured program composed from a basis set while do, if then else in the sequence, using only the in function and predicate nodes of the original program, along with tests and assignments to an additional label of no more than log n bits. Actually, the supremum of log n bits. So if the, if the log n turns out to be like 7.2, the answer is you need 8 bits. You need a full bit for that last bit. The proof is constructive. So we're going to take an arbitrary proper program and generate the execution equivalent structured program. What does that look like? Here's how that works. Step 1. Step 1 is probably the hardest step. Assign every operation in the program an integer and assign the exit the number 0. Wow, that was hard. So basically, you go through the program, and you label all the nodes with a number, and you label the exit line 0. Then you divide up the operations into classes, right? function nodes and predicate nodes. What about jump? What about jump to a computed location, etc.? Those are all complicating factors that we're not going to deal with right now. All right. We add a counter variable. In this case, we're going to call it C for counter. And this makes the program counter explicit. We convert each function node. So each little node, node I, performs function F and then flows to node next. What we do is we convert it to this. F followed by setting the counter to next, the address of the next thing. And we can treat that as the new node, f sub i. For our predicate, we play the same game. We set the counter based on that. And now it's not just a little naked predicate node. It's actually a proper if, then, else. So I have converted each of these into a program prime. This is a little sequence prime. This is an if, then, else prime. And again, I can treat each of these as if it were a simple function. Now, I add a superstructure around all of these that lets me simulate the original program structure. I initialize the counter to 1, and then while the counter hasn't reached 0, right, the exit line is labeled 0, I see if I should do 1. If so, I perform F1. If the counter is 2, I perform F2. If the counter is 3, I perform F3, and so on. And that's it. So, why are we doing this? Well, if I can take a complex, nasty spaghetti code program and turn it into a program that uses only a fixed set of structures, then I can write analysis for each of those structures 
and then analyze any program. All right. So I can take a program, I can break it down into a smaller set of problems, each of which I have a solution for, and then solve for the entire program. We might also do it to obfuscate a program. I take a nice clean program and I turn it into this crazy initialized loop with this variable counter thing in it and make a mess. That can also be done. So a question that you might have is, is the counter essential? Can I eliminate the counter? Well, look up at the top above the line here. I have three little structures. I have one which looks at a predicate. If true, is C is 2. If false, C is 3. So I initialize the counter to 1. I come in here. I run the code. Counter is 1. So I do this little block. At the end of this, C will either be 2 or it'll be 3. Let's say it's 2. I go around the loop. C is not 0. It's not 1, but it is 2. So I would then do this right here, this operation right here. I could just substitute this directly in place of C equal 2. I could do the same thing for C equal 3, and I've now converted these three structures into this new structure at the bottom. And I've eliminated the use of some values of the counter in doing that. In this case, structure 1, when P is true, does f followed by setting c equal to 4. When p is false, it does g set c equal to 1. But c was already 1, which means I go around and I do this same structure again. This is a while loop. And so I can directly encode it. Check to see if p is false. If it is, do g and repeat. If p is true, fall out, do f and set c equal to 4. So I can turn these sorts of things into an explicit loop. And notice I've eliminated the use of the C equal 1 for the counter. So the structure theorem has the, there's been a number of attempts to prove it. Lots of publications on it. First correct proof is due to a fellow named Harlan Mills. who was an IBM fellow. Uh, and it's pretty powerful. It basically tells you how to take one program and convert it into another that uses a limited number of structures, and that can be really good for analysis. So again, a proper program has a single entry, single exit. Uh, for every node of the program, there's a path from entry to exit that contains the node. There's no unreachable or trapped code. <laughs> code over on the right hand side is a proper program. It starts up at the top, it's got a loop in it, it ends at the bottom. It's a proper program. The question for you is, is it a structured program? Let's take a close look into here. So we come in here, we have a while loop, the while one loop. We have an if, if, else, so there's a sequence of things here. We, we have an if, which might return, then an if, else, some other stuff, and we never just follow the loop because the loop never ends. The only way to get out is through this return statement right here. Is that a proper, oh, sorry, is that a structured program? It's clearly a proper program. Enter here, exit here, everything is reachable. At first, it looks like the while might be a trap, but it's not because we can get out with that return. It turns out it, it is, in fact, uh, a proper program, not obviously a structured one. Is this a structured program? So here's another one. Here we have, we check BDEV, return null. Otherwise, we come in here and we have a return, a go to restart, some interesting stuff going on in here. Turns out this is a proper program. Whether it's a structured program remains to be seen. How about this? So here we have a whole bunch of things going on. But in particular, notice this jump not equal to 40154D. That's not in this list. 
And here is a jump to 401546, not in this list. We're exiting from this code and going to two different locations. So the code as you see it here is not a proper program because it has two different exits. Maybe if we saw more of the program, it would turn out as we expand the scope that those are within the program space and a larger program, a larger chunk of this would be a proper program, but we don't know that. Okay. So the point of a proper program is that it provides all the necessary context to be understood as a single function by itself. We know how you get in, we know how you get out. There's nothing mysterious about it. A proper program contains all of its reference. We would say it is referentially transparent. You can drop it in somewhere else and it will do what it does. If you want to reason about a program, especially if you want to write programs that analyze other programs, this is the kind of thing you want. What about this guy? Remember this thing? This is horrible. So this can't be anything. Well, when we take it and we pull the ends and we stretch it out, this is what it looks like. Yeah, it goes from 0 to 4 to 6 to 2 to 8. That's weird. But it's still just a sequence of instructions. It's a sequence. So it's not just a proper program. It's a structured program. <laughs> as perverse as that sounds, this is the structured program. All right, we're going to stop there. That's it.